Matt leads the Amidyar Network's operation and strategy. Uh, previously, Matt was an executive at eBay Inc. for eight years, serving as president of eBay International and the president of PayPal. As president of eBay International, Matt grew eBay's footprint from five to 25 countries and grew eBay International's annual revenue run rate from $10 million to $2 billion. As PayPal's first post-acquisition president, he helped triple revenue in two years and set the stage for PayPal's remarkable success. Matt also spearheaded eBay's initiatives in global development and citizenship. Prior to eBay, Matt was the North American president of Navtech, a management consultant with McKinsey & Company, a U.S. diplomat in Germany. Matt serves on the boards of British, Bridge International Academies, Endeavor, the G, IIIN, and Landiza. He earned an MBA with distinction from, Harvard, from the Harvard Business School and a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Washington. Please join me in welcoming Matt Banning. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's great to see you all here. Uh, I know it's pushing onto the evening and maybe people get a little tired, but hopefully uh, we, can, we can have a little fun today and, and uh, have some engagement. I guess the, I've been told there's three parts to the conversation tonight. Uh, one is uh, me telling you a little bit about my personal story, personal journey, career journey, if you will. Um, the second is uh, a presentation, uh, a description of what we do at the Amidiar Network. And the third, and where I'd like to get to quickly so I can see what's on your mind, uh, is, is the Q&A. Um, and I've got a few students from the class I teach at the business school here. And one of the things I note to them, as was noted earlier, is it would be great if all laptops were down. And I won't say that I may have noticed even one of my students uh, with the laptop uh, screen up. I, I, won't, I won't even go there, because uh, it never happened. But so please, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so personal background, um, studied international studies and economics, undergraduate. And um, it was interesting, when I, when I came out of undergraduate, like many, uh, I was thinking my senior year of finally getting around to thinking about what I was going to do. Um, and I wanted to, I had a real interest in uh, public service and specifically in international affairs. And I wanted to perhaps be a diplomat. I also felt the need to make some money. Uh, and I grew up, by the way, as the 12th of, of 13 kids. Uh, so that was very present in my mind. I had a lot of school debt. And so I got to make my way in the world. So I, I, I need to be practical, make some money. Uh, so I wanted to perhaps go in, into business. And a great place to start in business is in banking. And I also thought, and maybe then I want to go back to business school. So as I approached my uh, senior year and in my, into my senior year, I took the Foreign Service exam, which is required to get into the State Department. And fortunately, I passed with a score such that I knew I would ultimately be selected. And I got a job in banking in New York. And then a year later, I got accepted to business school, not to the Stanford Business School, but to the, the Stanford of the East in, in Boston. Uh, so then my plan was laid out. I spent two years in banking in New York, which provided me really with a fabulous foundation in finance, and the finance, I think, can provide you a real uh, view into how businesses operate and what are the critical drivers of business success. And then when there was a meltdown in, uh, somewhat of a meltdown in the, in the LB, leverage buyout market in uh, New York in, in, uh, in, in 1989, I went over and uh, became a US diplomat. And by the way, I should note kind of a fun story. Uh, how many of you have ever seen, and this probably will date me, the movie Zelig? Anybody seen the movie Zelig? <laughs> You've seen the movie Zelig? Okay. It's, it's a Woody Allen movie, and Woody Allen always finds himself showing up at these great historical events, just accidentally. And you see him in these old clips, and he's at these great historical events. You guys go, this guy's everywhere, right? And so when I, when I went to New York uh, to start in banking, my first day on the job was administrative work. And in the afternoon, I went down. I said, I want to see the stock exchange. I want to see what that's all about. And that was Black Monday in 1987, right? The stock, massive stock market crash. I said, wow, this is pretty interesting. And why, I was really lucky to be there. So my two years in banking, I go into diplomacy. I study German in college. They send me off to Germany. I get to Germany. And the day I get to Germany, the Berlin Wall comes down. <laughs> so like any good public servant, I tried to take as much credit as possible. Uh, for the great work I had done, but I had a fabulous couple years. 
really understanding at a very front, uh, front row view uh, all the things that were happening surrounding the fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of the Cold War, and the reunification of Germany. And the 25th uh, anniversary of the reunification is, of, of the fall of the wall is coming up this November. So I'm incredibly unfortunate to, ha fortunate to have that experience. Uh, and at that stage, they're going to send me to Guatemala City with the State Department, or I could go back to business school. And I like many things about the State Department. I love public service. Um, but for a number of reasons we, we, we could potentially talk about, I decided to go back to business school. And ha had a really good experience at business school, joined uh, the management consulting firm of McKinsey and Company, first as a summer associate in their uh, Euro Center office in Brussels, and then on a permanent basis here in San Francisco, which is what brought me to the Bay Area. After a stint at McKinsey, um, I thought, OK, McKinsey was fabulous because it provides a great foundation. Again, like banking, consulting can provide you with an excellent view on how businesses operate and enable you to engage with really thoughtful people on big strategic issues. But I felt it was about time to get my hands dirty a little bit and understand what it was to actually experience an operating role in a, in a real company. So I joined this company called Navtech. Anybody here heard of Navtech? Anybody here heard of Nokia? <laughs> Nokia mapping? A few of you. Okay, so Navtech was a company that built turn-by-turn uh, -turn map databases for vehicle navigation systems. So how many of you have been in a vehicle with a vehicle navigation system, right? <laughs> Almost assuredly, that's a Navtech map that you're using. And Navtech was this wonderful startup that burned through about $400 million before it made a profit. And I went on to and joined Navtech initially as a strategy guy, which is what you do when you come out of consulting. Three months in, the gentleman who was leading Navtech North America resigned. And Navtech North America at that time was 400 people. And he resigned. And uh, they turned to me and they said, you mind, act, you mind running Navtech on an acting basis? And in fact, the way it happened, it's a little fun little story, is we were at a, 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 a management offsite. And there were about 15 of us around this big table, right? And people were commenting around the last two days of the offsite and what they had learned, right? And it was going around the, the, the circle, and I was towards the end of the circle, and I get this little note from the chairman of Navtech. And it said, Matt, there's a little note, imagine me sitting there, and I'd been there about six months. It said, Matt, uh, Jim has resigned. You are the new acting president. Please say something profound. <laughs> So that was my introduction to general management. I had never managed a person in my life, right? And I remember saying to the chairman when he left after a couple days, I'm like, what do I do? Do I call a meeting? I mean, <laughs> literally, it was at that level. And he said, look, Matt, you're smart, and people like you. You'll figure it out. <laughs> now, you can read all the management books you want. And ultimately, in some ways, it comes down to that. Right? Being smart and building relationships. If you can use your intellect, and everybody here, you're at Stanford, has the intellect. And if you can build good relationships and understand people, then you can succeed in, in the realm of general management. So that was a fabulous experience for me. I did that on an acting basis for five years. The company was moving back to Chicago. I don't know if there are any Chicagoans here. I have nothing against Chicago, but I wanted to stay here. And so I, I began thinking about, you know, who would I want to work for? And here's another po point where serendipity comes in. I love maps. And I was looking for a map of northern Germany, where my grandfather immigrated from around 1870. And so I, 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 was, I was in a mapping company. So I asked around, you know, what, mapping, what is the best mapping store in San Francisco to go to to find this map? Where, who has the best selection? And the guy said, mapping store? He said, You're, you need to check out this thing called eBay. I said, eBay, what's that? Right, so this was 90, uh, 98. And he said, www.ebay.com. Right, so I checked it out and I said, wow. I didn't find the map I was looking for, but the selection was amazing, right? absolutely amazing. And then it clicked. What an amazing business model, right? So it's a commission base. 
it scales on technology. It's going viral. More buyers bring more sellers. More sellers bring more buyers. Commission, right? It's, it's a beautiful business model. I would like to work there. And I looked up and I found out it was in San Jose, in Campbell, to be precise. And I was commuting from Santa Cruz. I said, that's, that's fabulous, right? And so then it was a, it was a case of try, trying to figure out, so how do I get a job at eBay? And I saw that the CFO at eBay and the CEO had gone to Harvard Business School, right? So, oh my gosh, there's a connection. So I wrote to the CFO because the CEO would never talk to me, right? That she's a CEO, she's too busy. CFO never responded to my, to my emails. But I did meet a guy through my mother-in-law who knew Meg Whitman, who was a CEO. In fact, Meg used to work for him at Hasbro. And I met, my mother-in-law introduced me to him. He said, have you heard about eBay? I said, yes, I've been trying to talk to somebody at eBay. He said, oh, great, I know Meg Whitman. I'll introduce you. The next day, I was copied on the email to Meg, interview the day after that. Three days later, I had the job. The only potential downside is I'm at that stage feeling doubly indebted to my mother-in-law. <laughs> um, but, but the upside is, now I'm on at eBay. And the first question I asked Meg, of course, is, like, I, I, Meg, Meg actually asked me. She said, why didn't you find us sooner? I said, I tried. I was sending Gary all these emails. She, she laughed. She said, Gary never returns emails. I was like, how was I supposed to know that? So another case of serendipity and also shoot high, right? Never, don't be bashful in reaching out to the person you want to talk to because you never know. If I would written an email to Meg, I would have had that job four months earlier, and I would have been pre-IPO rather than post-IPO. <laughs> um, when public in September of 99, I joined in April, I mean, September of 98, I joined in April of 99. Fabulous time at eBay. I went from, by the way, being president of Naptech North America and the corner office to a cubicle at eBay. Why did I do that? Because eBay was growing hugely, very, very fast, and I believed I could perform, right? Otherwise, it'd make no sense to go, see, this is the thing. People sometimes get obsessed about title. Why would you go from president to director in a smaller startup-oriented company? But if you believe in yourself and they've got a growth story, go for it. And it doesn't matter whether you have the office or, or, the, or the cubicle. If you believe in yourself, you can do it. I was hired to run new business. I was excited to run new business. But eBay had a problem. They had a problem in customer support. And they had a specific problem because they had just banned the sale of firearms on eBay. What does this have to do with me? So Meg calls me in her office and she says, Matt, we have a big problem in customer support and they've just, we've just banned firearm sales on eBay and getting so many more inquiries and some angry customers. Of course, I said, Meg, what does this have to do with me? And she said, I want you to run customer support. And I said, I don't know anything about customer support, and I don't really want to do it. She said, please run customer support. So I ran customer support. And I go back to my cubicle, and with five, within five minutes, I was talking to outraged NRA members on the phone. <laughs> but you know, those months in customer support really helped me understand the customer. And then I took on, I got promoted to run product and community. Then I got promoted to run eBay Europe. Then I got promoted to run eBay International. And I think I, did re I was doing reasonably well, but also the business was exploding. So another career lesson, again, back to that. Go with a business that has great growth prospects. I loved eBay International because I love things international. It blended the sort of diplomat international affairs orientation interest I had, and it was growing fabulously well. In the time that I was at eBay, we went from an annual revenue run rate of $8 million to $2 billion for eBay International. And it was fascinating to see how the model would carry in different co uh, countries around the world. Now, a few years into when I was running eBay International, uh, eBay bought PayPal. And Meg came to me again and said, well, Matt, we bought PayPal. And so, yeah, Meg, I'm well aware. Well, what does that have to do with me? Right? Well, I want you to run PayPal. Hmm, I'm not sure whether I want to run PayPal. I'm having a great time here at eBay International. Do I really want to go do this new, this, this, this acquisition, and it's an integration, and I don't know anything about payments, and Blah, blah, blah. And I remember a two-hour conversation I had with Meg where she was encouraging me to do this. It was a bus ride. I remember the bus ride. She had me sitting right next to her. And um, I was still sort of on the fence a little bit. And, <laughs> and, and just as I'm leaving, Meg said, one more thing, Matt. I said, what? And she said, you know, at Disney, I work for Michael Eisner. Okay. 
And she said, nobody ever said no to Michael Eisner. So I knew that I probably should go run PayPal. <laughs> uh, but that too was a fabulous experience. Really terrific. And PayPal, uh, I think everybody here is familiar with PayPal. Um, it, was, it, was a, it was a hugely innovative product at the time. It really helped eBay because it accelerated what we call the velocity of trade or the speed with which people are trading on the site. PayPal was great for eBay. eBay was great for PayPal. Uh, PayPal enabled eBay to more, be more successful internationally. It was a wonderful business and a wonderful experience for me. Now, um, after running PayPal, I went back to international because that's the thing I, I really loved and enjoyed a few more years there. But then, one of the things I realized, one of the things I really loved about eBay and my experience at eBay is that we were running a business, but that business was having fabulous social impact. More than a million people were earning their livelihood by selling on eBay. And so it wasn't just I, was, I wasn't just you know, uh, uh, peddling toothpaste or, or, or selling cars. I was actually creating a business that created opportunity for individuals. It was a level playing field where people could engage on the internet and buy and sell and build livelihoods. And that was really exciting. And a lot of people who were entrepreneurs on eBay were not necessarily the people you would necessarily think would be entrepreneurs or would have opportunities to be entrepreneurs. So one of the demographics that skewed very positively on eBay was single moms. Right? And it makes sense. They want to be home with their kid. They want flexibility. And on eBay, you didn't have to not 9 to 5. And what really mattered was whether you could sell a product effectively and whether you followed through credibly with that transaction. So I love this element of eBay that was around social impact. Nevertheless, even at eBay, it was a business. And I was interested in that phase of my career to become increasingly focused on not necessarily just a business that, that would do good socially, but to have my primary focus of my work be the social impact. And that for business, then, as a tool to drive the social impact rather than just being exclusively on, on, on driving, a, driving a great business. And at that time, I, you know, I'd known Pierre at that time for eight years. Pierre Midiar, the founder of eBay, for eight years. I was familiar with what he was doing at this thing called the Omidyar Network. And I had a series of conversations with him about the strategy of Omidyar Network and whether I might contribute to that strategy. And that eventually turned into him encouraging me to think about going over and running the Omidyar Network. So I thought about that long and hard. And I did a pro-con list. Right? Here's all the reasons I should go join Pierre and run the MDR network. And here's all the reasons I should stay at eBay. And I thought long and hard. And I kind of wring my hands. And I talked to a lot of people. And it was a really hard decision because I loved eBay. And there were a lot of great things about staying at eBay. And I was wrestling with this. And I woke up one morning and I said, hold on. This is actually not a question of about a pro-con list. Right? This is a question of what do I want to do and what am I about? And here's a guy for whom I have great affinity, with whom I'm great, greatly aligned on a whole host of issues. And he's got seven or eight billion dollars. And he's committing this money, it's been committing this capital to the betterment of mankind in his lifetime. And he's asking me to lead the charge. Right? How can I say no? How can you say no, right? Imagine yourself in that situation, right? When you have that sort of opportunity, and if you are values driven, and think about what a lot of parents here probably have told you since you were little, you sort of say, gut check, what do I do? And so for that, at that moment, I knew I had no choice, right? If I was going to do something consistent with who I felt I wanted to be, I didn't have a choice. And sometimes having no choice can be very liberating. Because you know the path, and you just go. And it's been a fabulous ride. So I've been at a mini network now seven years. And um, it's been terrific. And thoroughly enjoying what we do. And also feeling that all of those experiences that I gave you a little thumbnail sketch of kind of prepared me to do what I'm doing now. I couldn't be as effective in my role at a Midiar network 
as an investor if I hadn't had those years in banking. I don't think I'd have as broad of a perspective on the world if I hadn't studied international affairs and been a diplomat and built eBay International, right? I don't think I could understand the entrepreneur if I hadn't joined eBay as employee number 130 and been there when we were at about 40,000, right? So all of these things, I think, contributed to, frankly, preparation for me to contribute and, and do the role I'm doing today. So that's the personal background piece of it. Let me talk a little bit about a mini our network. It's a clicker. Let me check how we're doing on time. Okay. Oh, it's May 12th. Did you realize it's May 12th? Uh, sorry about this. <laughs> But you should probably, when you, make, when you do, make an error on a slide, you probably shouldn't call everybody's attention to it, should you? <laughs> the stakes are pretty low here, but, you know. Okay. I want to kind of click through these uh, slides pretty quickly, and if there's stuff that captures your attention or interest, uh, we can, you can ask about it. So as noted, we're a philanthropic investment firm, and we do early stage, so almost a philanthropic venture firm, <laughs> uh, founded by Pam and Pierre. The fundamental belief that every human, we have this fundamental belief that every human being is inherently capable. And what differentiates us frequently is opportunity. We're all born with an inherent capability, but we have a different opportunity set. So what we really want to do is to create opportunity. Not create equal outcomes, but try and create a more equal set of opportunities. Because when, we, when you do that, we think that people will seize those opportunities and improve the lives of themselves, their family, and ultimately in society. And that's what we saw at eBay, right? There was a fundamental lesson at eBay, and therefore is the center of what we do at the Media Network. And then we invest in and support entrepreneurial ventures that we think can have massive social impact. We want to drive, we want to help drive change, not only with individual entities, but at a sector level. What do I mean by that? So we invest, for example, in a firm called Bridge Academies in Africa. Has anybody here heard of Bridge? 300 schools in Kenya, certainly my students who took the class, I was expecting that, thank you. Uh, we had a case study on Bridge. 300 schools started in the slums of, of Nairobi, delivering fabulous quality education for about $7 a month tuition. Bridge, I think, will get to 1,000 schools. Right? They may ultimately be educating 500,000 or a million students, but when, we, when we're really excited about that, but could be more, even more exciting if others see that model and they replicate that model in multi multiple countries around the world. So the idea of transformative education for the poor in the developing world can take off. So that's what I mean by sector level change. We provide financial capital, some money. We provide human capital. A lot of times when you're engaging in entrepreneurial ventures, the entrepreneur, the social entrepreneur, doesn't just need the money, they need mentorship. They need skills, they need teams, they need strategy, they need marketing. We really get behind the entrepreneurs and help them try and realize their vision. Intellectual capital, we're learning a lot. We want to share that with the world. And network capital, it's in the name. How do we connect investees so that they can help each other succeed, so they can partner? So I was just in, in, uh, uh, in Johannesburg two weeks ago, and there's a place called, there's a tech hub there uh, called the, 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 the Josie Hub that we've helped fund. And there's a gentleman who works out of the Josie Hub who does some really cool, innovative mobile technology. He's partnered with 20 other organizations in the Media Our Network, including with Wikipedia to make Wikipedia legible and readable on the basic phones that so many Africans still have. So we love creating that network and seeing people partner with each other so that they can multiply their impact. Um, principles for us were catalytic. So we want to go where we can actually go and make a difference. We want to be innovative. We believe in the, in the power of the market. So we have market-based solutions. Um, this is important. I'll mention in a moment. We deploy our capital flexibly. So we, don't, we do grants and investments. We do grants where we expect never to see any of the money back. We do investments where we expect high returns, and we do everything in between. But the capital serves the business rather than the capital demanding a return. So, why do we do each? For not, we do nonprofit grants, 
because if you don't, because markets are good at a lot of things, but markets aren't good at the provision of public goods, like, uh, like, like water or clean air. And they underinvest in public goods. People who don't have money, right, disadvantaged populations, don't have the disposable income to send signals to the market about what's important. You know, the, the world spends more on uh, male pattern baldness than on malaria vaccines. Now, I don't know if there are any men here with receding hairlines. I don't mean to be insulting about the importance of male pattern baldness. But malaria, for goodness sakes, is funded less. Right? So why is that? Because different populations have different amounts of money to send signals to the market about what's important. So markets are important because they can get you scale, but sometimes there are market failures. And also we'll provide grants to subsidize certain goods and services that have what economists would call positive externalities. So if you vaccinate a child or you educate a child, the benefits of that isn't just to the child, it's to society. So again, the market will underinvest in public goods. They will underinvest for disadvantaged populations, and they will underinvest for certain goods and services that have these positive externalities. Those are real roles for, for grants to the Mini R network. We also think that for-profit investments are really important for social change. Why? Because one critical reason is if you're delivering a product or service and somebody has to pay for it, you know they value it. If it's free, how do you know if they actually value the product or service that you're providing? So if you have a business, you have to deliver value or you go out of business. It's very Darwinian that way. Self-sustainability. In the last 40 years, there have been only about 140 not-for-profits that have gone from zero in revenue to 50 million. So 140 in 40 years, zero to 50 million. In the meantime, there have been tens of thousands of businesses who have accomplished that feat. So I'm not trying to say one is better than the other, but I can say that businesses have the ability to scale. Why? Because they're generating revenue. So if we think about social change, businesses have to be an element of the social change because they provide that sort of scale. Which Flow nicely into my last point. So self-sustainability, scale, and value to the customer. Uh, these are initiatives. We engage in consumer internet and mobile, in education, financial inclusion, government transparency, and property rights. So rather than investing across everything, those are the initiatives where we think we can empower individuals to have that sort of impact that we're looking for. And this is just some examples of investments in each of those areas. Uh, Change.org, which is a social action platform. Bridge Academies, I've described. Uh, financial inclusion, there's a company called Lendo, which uses your social graph, that is, who you're connected with on Facebook and elsewhere in the internet, to determine whether you're credit worthy. So how do you get out of this catch-22 where you need credit to get credit? You check out your social graph. And if, you're with trust, if you know trustworthy people and they pay, then you're likely to pay. If you don't, so it's using another mechanism to provide, typically in this case, small loans to disadvantaged populations. So we call it big data, small money. Big data, small loans. Uh, Code for America, this is putting coders in cities around the country who can help drive innovation, innovative applications for government so government can serve the people better. And property rights, uh, this the biggest determinant of Poverty in a developing world is whether somebody has access or owns the land that they work. And so this initiative is all around enabling people to get greater use rights for the land that they till. Um, we have committed almost $700 million to date. $314 million for profit, $374 million not for profit. Uh, heavily, you know, heavily invested in India, Africa, and the US. Uh, with also some significant activity in London, which is where our uh, government transparency initiative is centered. And we, I don't know if we have the video. Shoot, we had a video here, um, but we haven't queued it up most likely. But I'll have, to, I'll have to send that along. We have a new brand video that talks about our new tagline, which is a world of positive returns. And the world of positive returns has several uh, connotations. One is you make investments, you're going to get financial returns, so those are positive. But you're going to get social returns, which are positive. If you engage with communities, you get positive social return. Right? 
So it's kind of a fun play on, on that, that phrase that we hope speaks to the essence of the MDR network. So with that, thank you, and we can move to Q&A. OK, and I'll cold call one of my students if we don't get any, any questions. Uh, so, the, so the question, uh, if you didn't all hear, was how do we think about the mix between grants and for-profit investments, and what's the underlying strategy, and what is the role in grants in building a foundation for some of our other work? So fabulous question. We don't have a number per se. We have a philosophy that says there should be a balance, that we should use all sorts of investment tools that we have, including high return businesses, low return businesses, and grants. Um, and we have this notion that it should be re reasonably well split. And some years it's 50, 55, 45, or 60, 40, and then it flips the way back. And, and, but so roughly it's a 50, 50, but we don't get stressed out about any given year or even that this might be 53, 47, or whatever. We, we think there's a balance. And as long as we feel that we're meeting our strategic objectives, uh, we, we're not too troubled by the, the percentages of the two. One of the important roles that I think you're, you're uh, underscoring that grants play is it's not just grants to support individual organizations, it's grants to support uh, an entire um, ecosystem or a sector. So for example, we are doing a lot of work in financial inclusion. So we'll make for-profit investments, for example, in mobile money solutions uh, uh, around the world. And we'll also make, however, uh, not-for-profit investments in, um, in like the GSMA or the Better Than Cash Alliance. And Better Than Cash Alliance is GSMA is the industry association that does a lot of work on mobile for development and mobile money for development. And Better Than Cash Alliance is an alliance that works with governments to convert cash payments to digital payments, right? And one of the great stories or anecdotes in there is when they did that to the policemen in Afghanistan, when they, when they stopped giving them money in the envelopes and they gave them money on a debit card, they reported getting 30% more money, right? Because some things were getting lost from the envelope along the way. Um, so, and that's a fairly typical story. So having, having people go from doing grants to get governments to make so many of their bilateral payments from cash to digital helps create that infrastructure, and then you can also invest in the mobile money plays that help accelerate the market further. Uh, and we'll also do low returns businesses, like in microfinance. One of the big problems in microfinance is if you're a local microfinance institution, say in Kazakhstan, and you borrow in dollars, but your transactions are in the local currency, I don't know who knows what the Kazakh currency is, but uh, bonus points for that. Uh, then there, there's, there's, a, there's a, uh, a, a risk, a, fin a financial risk that you take based on exchange rate movements. So we've invested in a company called MFX that hedges exotic currencies. So that the MFI can hedge their currency exposure and build more viable businesses. And MF MFX has hedged more than a billion dollars of, 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 of transactions now. So we probably will get a low single digit return on MFX, but it's creating infrastructure for the rest of that sector to move forward. Mm -hmm. the, 
comment in the question, if it's helpful re repeating, yeah, um, is there's a lot of hype around social entrepreneurship. Uh, and there's also a reality that big M multinational companies have scale and can have huge impact from what they're doing. And so how do we at Amity, our network, think about the role of investing in those social entrepreneurs in the context of also recognizing that, that big companies can do a lot of good? Did I capture it? Um, I mean, I, 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 I do think, well, here, we're in Silicon Valley, right? So entrepreneurship and innovation are revered here. And so there's a natural tendency to embrace the new, the innovative, the risk-taking, the breakthrough ideas. Um, so, and, 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 I, and, I, and by the way, I do think they're important because I do think there are organizations like Bridge Academies or another one that emerged from Stanford is D-Light. So D-Light, we are familiar with D-Light. Uh, D-Light produces low-cost solar lanterns, about $8 a pop, that it, that it enables people to replace kerosene in a safe, effective way and also has great positive environmental impacts. They're shipping 150,000 units a month now, right? That is beginning to operate at scale. And by the way, they may be able to get to a million units a month and get to the size of a, of a, of a, of a larger company. So they have a role. I would also agree with you that the big MNCs have a, a Walmart, right? If Walmart changes their packaging requirements just a little bit, that has massive implications. So I think, I think both ends of the spectrum are important. We play in the early stage innovative segment because that's what we know and that's our heritage and that's where we think that, that, we, can, that we can make some impact. Yeah. So what metrics do we track to, to, to um, know whether we're on the right track or not? So with the for-profit companies, it's financial return and social impact. So everything we do, first of all, has a social impact screen. So we will not invest in anything, for-profit or not-for-profit, that is not having a profoundly positive social impact. Once we make an investment for the for-profits, it's financial return and social impact. For the not-for-profits, it's obviously social impact. Now, we think about the financial return in different ways. So first of all, it's a number you can calculate, so it's clear and you know how you're doing on the financial return. Um, we like companies that generate high rates of return because then you know you're serving a customer well, and if you're generating high rates of return, others will try and replicate what you're doing. So you have competition, and with competition, you get more innovation, and the prices ultimately come down and the quality goes up. And that's sort of the market mechanism at work. And you, in fact, see that that happens. So there's a lot of debate around, oh, my gosh, should we feel guilty if we're earning a return? Well, you've got to be thoughtful about that. But if you are making a return, it's actually going to bring more people in the market and drive further innovation. Right? Now, we also, so we get excited when we have high return businesses. But we also think that there are many different types of return that we need to think about so that we don't get obsessed with financial return. So in the case of MFX, maybe they get 2 or 3% return. We don't know yet. But maybe we're, we think that's fabulous because they're developing that, that market infrastructure. So, so you can't just look at the financial return in isolation. You've got to then compare it to the, to the social impact. And then when we go, obviously when we look at the not-for-profits, we look at social impact. Now then the next question typically is, well, how do you measure social impact? right? And the challenge is social impact is in the eye of the beholder. And I don't know how you develop a number which compares the importance of one year of education with uh, immunization against malaria with greater government transparency. Right? There, there, I, I think that's a bit of a fool's errand. Um, you can say you'd rather educate 1,000 kids than 100, but how do you begin to make those trade-offs? So rather than trying to develop a, a, a mega metric for our work, we look within each of the initiatives right, and say, OK, how many people now have greater access to land? Or how many people now have greater access to financial services? So we, look, we measure that impact within each of the initiatives. Yeah. Is there I, a way you think about that in terms of geography? Like you, you said that you're most comfortable in India and Africa, but like, uh, do you think about that when you're evaluating uh, companies? So we think about impact. And a person is a person is a person, right? Um, we are engaged in India and Africa 
to a significant degree because that's where you have a concentration of, of lower income uh, populations. One of the things we need to recognize, however, is it's very difficult to build a profitable model serving the very poor. Right? There's this book that came out years ago called The Fortune at the Base of the Pyramid. And I, I think there are viable business models for working poor, clearly for emerging middle class. It's really hard to develop a viable model working with uh, the destitute. It's because it's re there's just not that disposable income. And this is one of the things we wrestle with, okay? It's like, okay, you can serve a more wealthy population and develop a nice business with good returns, but then are you going away from your mission? Are you creating less social impact, less opportunity? You can go down to lowering, serving lower income, but then you're not going to be able to generate the revenue to grow and to expand. Right? So going back to the D-Light example, um, if you talk to Don Tice, who's the CEO of D-Light, he'll say, well, we almost went bankrupt going to the base of the pyramid and trying to develop a business to serve the very poor. So we went actually up market a little bit and began to serve the, the, the working poor and develop the distribution system so that now we're actually beginning to reach down into the less affluent segments of society. So it's, 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 it's something we wrestle with. And it also comes into then your broader question about geographies. And one of the things we talk about, is should we go to Latin America, for example, right, where there still is significant disadvantaged population, but higher disposable income so you can build more readily, build viable business models that then can be replicated. So that's one of the things, one of the critical questions that we, uh, that we really wrestle with. Yeah. Yeah. So there's several questions embedded in there about how do we think about returns and success of returns. Um, I guess the first principle I'd come back with is, is that we don't just look at the return number as a good or bad. I really try and encourage our investment professionals to say what returns you expect to get financially and socially and then try to get those or go above those numbers. Um, and so in other words, if, if, somebody, if somebody says, okay, we're going to get an 8% return on this, and they get an 8% return, that's better, in my view, than somebody saying, we're going to get a 30% return, and you end up with 12. Right? Because, because when you're going with that 8, you're also factoring in the other elements of social impact that you're trying to drive. And if you're going to really high, then maybe you're not figuring in huge elements of social impact. So if your return is low, maybe you ultimately weren't as successful. So we try and think about going in, what is our expectation on success, both from a financial perspective and from a social impact perspective. In terms of distribution, we'll have a, a distribution of our investments, of our for-profit investments, not unlike a VC. And typically with a venture capital firm, a big percentage of the companies just fail. And what you rely on is the relatively few that have hugely successful operations to bring up your overall return. One of the challenges we face in that respect is that the extent you're working with disadvantaged populations, when you start generating a huge return, sometimes there can be a lot of questions around generating a huge return working with a disadvantaged population. So there's almost this political risk. And I don't want to sound too pejorative saying a political risk. There's a, there's a, there's a market, there's a PR, there's a, a, a concerns that people begin to have if you're making too much money serving a disadvantaged population. So again, one of the things we wrestle with is geez, what, what are the implications of that for our model? If we have a VC model and we're dependent upon a few home runs, but we're serving populations in which it's hard to have a home run without a certain backlash, then how do we think about evolving our model? So, and these are, you know, and, and I, 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 I'm just being very open about the stuff that we're still, you know, we're still wrestling with these kinds of things. And so those are both excellent questions. Yes? Talk about companies that uh, ultimately fail. What, in your experience, are the most common ways that these companies, which you are profits or non-profits, that you trusted with, that you said, oh, they have a good mission, good, sustainable, scalable, yeah. whatever, and then they fail? 
What were the most common reasons why these so several, and I suspect they're similar as you would find in the VC world. Um, and not to be overly simplistic, uh, wrong entrepreneur, right? And, and people will tell you always it's better to have uh, uh, an A entrepreneur and a B business plan than a, 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 a B entrepreneur and an A business plan. So it is all about the entrepreneur and specifically the entrepreneur's uh, diligence, tenacity, ability to think on their, on their, on their quickly evolve to market conditions. So that's the most critical thing is getting the getting making sure you you really understand the entrepreneur. It's why, by the way, so many investors like to find entrepreneurs who've been there before and who have a track record for success. Right? Um, and the second one is 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 the business model. It's the product market fit not being just right. And sometimes a company is too early to market and they 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 miss it by you know at Navtech I was joking we actually did spend four hundred million dollars before we were probably there ten years too early. I didn't tell you the part of the story, which is Nokia ultimately bought out Navtech for $10, $10 billion. And, uh, and so it was a good end of that story. But Navtech was developing turn-by-turn -turn navigation before, you know, in 15 years ago. So wait, timing is really important. One of the other common mistakes is the entrepreneur who thinks he or she has the, their business model nailed, and they expand very, very quickly and burn through a lot of cash, and they realize they hadn't really nailed the core what we, in business terms, say unit economics. They hadn't, hadn't really understand how the financial model was going to work when they scaled to 100 units of something. And then, so they scaled too fast. So people talk about nail it and scale it, right? And they hadn't really nailed the model before they really tried to blow it out. So those are just some of the, some of the, uh, the, the common you know, patterns that we see. Yeah? Well, from what I understand, as you move, from NetTech to omit their network, the meaning of the business kind of increased. And I want to ask, how did your management style change with it? Mm. Mm. So the question is, how did my management style change with the different meaning in the, in the business that I was operating? I'm not sure it did a lot. I think the thing that was the biggest driver in the evolution of my management style was just experience. And the biggest thing I, I learned was the important, again, it sounds pretty straightforward, but really, really important, is the, 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 the critical importance of hiring really good people and, and letting them, trusting them. Uh, and by the way, hiring really good people who ha are people of character as well as competence. Right? It was really interesting because I think character without competence you don't want to go there. You're not going to be successful. Competence without character can be dangerous. It was really interesting. I'll just share a little, little vignette here. Um, the Dalai Lama was in town talking at Santa Clara a few months ago. And there was a speaker there from one of the early pioneers in Silicon Valley. And he was, the, the, the subject was ethical business. right? And he was talking about the importance of hiring the very best people, which is what I'm talking about here as well. I learned the importance of hiring the very best people, and I got good at hiring the very best people. Right? So we went on and on about you hire the smartest person, a person that's smarter than you are, and he described this for, at some length. And then he turned to the Dalai Lama for any comments or questions. And the Dalai Lama said, well, what if that smartest person is deceitful? I think it's just really important. Right, particularly if we're interested in social impact and social entrepreneurship, we want to be working with people of character as well as of competence, people who care about the business, people who care about those that they're trying to serve. And by the way, that makes it a lot more fulfilling for each of us. The best thing at Omidyar Network for me is the people that we have been able to bring on the team, the people who self-select because they care about the issues we work on, people who come from the private sector to ON, take a pay cut. And for me, it's important that they take a pay cut because that tells me they're committed to the mission. And when you work with people who are committed to the mission, it's a beautiful thing. Right? It is just incredibly rewarding to work with people of character who are committed to serving other people. And that imbues everything you do, right? Because they treat each other in a certain way. They treat the entrepreneurs in a certain way. Because they've joined an organization that's focused on respecting the individual and creating opportunity for the individual. Oh, by the way, the other thing I learned, get out of the detail. 
I remember when I was, when I was a young manager, I, so when I was 30 and I suddenly had 40 people, 400 people I was responsible for, like I was into the detail. And then over time you realize that that's the recipe for disaster. You know, hire really good people who can take care of all that stuff for you. Now, of course, in a startup environment, you have to be in the detail, but figuring out when to, when to elevate and trust the high character, high competence people around you is really important. Yeah. And how you think about on those different buckets of funding, is there kind of a top down, we really want to push government transparency this year? Are you just looking for great companies and building it from the bottom up? Kind of how are you sourcing deals and making sure that you are being impactful in all of the key categories where you want to make the world a better place? Yes. So how do we think about the balance across our initiatives and where we invest? We are really uh, very bottoms up. So I'm not sitting there saying, OK, across these six initiatives, we should do 15% here, 20 It really depends upon the deal flow. And the deal flow really depends upon the individual investment professional who understands her or his market and who's going out and bringing those deals in. And what we found is the more, not surprisingly, the more focused we are within each initiative, the more deal flow we see. And the more you hire great people, the more deal flow you see and the more you, you, you scale those. So, um, so it's really a bottoms up driven by the frontline investment professionals. Yeah. A quick follow up to that. Um, is that also how you think about how much you allocate within a given year? Or are you thinking yes. about the total budget or just the great ideas can't make it further? So uh, <coughs> yes and yes. So we, we, don't, we create a capital budget or range every year. Um, but the range is sufficiently high such that if we do see good deals, we can fund those good deals. So that is absolutely not a constraint, and our board has been fabulous about supporting that. And our board is Pam, or Pam Amidiar, uh, Pierre, uh, a senior advisor for many, many years, Mike Moore, and me. And that's the, that's the board at, at ON. And we have, within the Amidiar network, more of a partnership structure, not in a legal sense, but the notion of, I wanted to hire a lot of really senior people who could be running businesses or investment houses themselves. And so I wanted a partnership model where I could get those people who would, would come to, to work with that idea of, of, of partnership and, and, a, and a shared commitment rather than having a hierarchical organization. I don't want to be a CEO. I don't want to be president. I, I'd rather be in that partnership model where I can attract peers who are all committed equally to a mission. Yeah, so it's, it's a great question. How does one evolve a career and, and develop a career around having social impact? Um, I'm really happy I spent so many years just in the commercial world. And I think the commercial world prepared me really well for what I'm doing today. If I had gone into the not-for-profit world, I don't think I would have had the opportunity to do the things I do today. I mean, simply, I mean, you can say, like, Straight. Well, I wouldn't have known Pierre, so therefore. But I think ge more generally speaking, um, there are a set of skills that you learn in the private sector that are incredibly valuable when you come to the intersection of business and social impact. And um, there are some fabulous not-for-profits out there, but there are a lot of small not-for-profits that are stuck below that $50 million range who, for, that find it difficult to have the impact in the world. So the stuff that I get most excited about is, biz, is organizations, and they tend to be businesses, but I'll say organizations where the, the social impact is embedded in the model, and businesses that will only succeed if they serve that population. Bridge Academies is only going to succeed if they serve the poor incredibly well in Kenya. If they don't, they're out of business, right? So it's not a choice of whether they want to or not. They have to, right? So it's a social impact is embedded in the business model. Um, so I, I think there's, if you, if you want to do social impact, and especially if you want to do impact investing, investing in firms that have a, so, a social double or triple bottom line, private sector experience is, in, is incredibly valuable. Now, I would also then say, 
if somebody is interested in social impact and not crazy about business, you know, then don't kill yourself for the next 15 years in business. If there's something you, you feel passionate about and you love and you want to go off and you want to, you want to start that orphanage in this country, if that speaks to you, go do it. Right? And, but, but for me and what I do, that, that foundation in private sector firms was, was, was absolutely essential. And I think for a lot of people, those will be important skills to, to garner. Other question? We have one more question, probably. So the question is, what is our fund structure? We really don't. And how does it promote the sustainability of these investments? Yeah. So, and how does it how does it promote the continued in investment if the returns are modest? So we don't have a fund structure. We more we get an annual capital budget that we use to invest in for profits and to to uh, to do our grant making. So most foundations. Have this massive corpus over here, right? And then they grant 5% of that a year. That's the typical. Uh, we have a corpus in the foundation, but that's over here and will be replenished over time. Um, and then we just go to the board for approval of individual deals when we, when we are seeking approval. So there's no real fund. That said, of course, it is important. One of the reasons it's important to generate returns is so we can recycle that money to make additional investments. But that does not constrain the investments or the amount of investments that we make. Do we have one more question, or should we wrap? Uh, one, more. one more? OK. Here is better. It's going to be the best question all evening. Yes? Um, based on your experience, what are some things you can do to help those nonprofits that you said are under the $50 million mark that are stuck, that are kind of dependent on grants? to get from year to year? Like, yeah. what helps them become self-sustaining? Yeah, so great question. So what can we, as a media art network, do to help not-for-profits scale, right? There's several things. Um, help them become more effective. One of the ways we can do that is, one of the things that frustrates me about the world that not-for-profits operate in is this fixation against, quote, overhead which gets them, which forces not-for-profits to underinvest in people and talent. And what's true in the for-profit world about the entrepreneur being the, being the driver of success, people being the driver of success, also true, if not more so, in the not-for-profit world. Yet we have this mentality where that's overhead. You know, talent is overhead and we shouldn't do it. One of the ways we try and overcome that is we recognize that one of the hurdles for not-for-profits Hiring really exceptionally talented people is you have to hire a recruiter. We have a, full, we have a team of six full-time people who recruit for us and also for our grantees, our investees. So we will help them find exceptional talent, and we will help them place that talent so that they can scale. So that's one thing we can do. Another thing we can do is what, do what we call crowd in other investors. So, help an organization succeed, and then help it raise additional funds. So one of the areas we work in, so I think a lot of people are familiar with the term impact investing, and that applies to our, our for-profit investments. There's another term called venture philanthropy, which had some, had some was in parlance several years ago, but it's, I think, an important term. And the notion is investing early stage and not-for-profits. Now, what we do is we invest early stage and not-for-profits, and we commit to either a three-year grant either one three-year grant or two three-year grants. So we commit to be with that organization for three to six years. But then we say, after that, you're on your own. Now, the criticism of that has been, oh my gosh, so you're going you're gonna to bring them down this path, and then you're going to drop them. But what we've found is we invest early, we help them scale up, and they get on the radar of a lot of grant-making institutions, which help them go further. And what we also encourage them to do is develop a revenue model so that they can become self-sustaining. So I don't know of any organizations in our portfolio where we have given them substantial grant money and then stopped and they've gone bust. What's happened is they scale further. So some of the examples of, of organizations we bet on very early, Ashoka, here's, who's heard of Ashoka? We gave them $20 million. 
when their annual budget was maybe, I think, four or five million a year, right? Five-year grant. They went like this. Bill Drayton and, and, and crew did a fabulous job. We exited, but they still grew. Who's heard of Donors Choose? So this is um, classroom projects, so you could donate to a public school classroom projects. Same deal. We're in early, scaled massively, and they actually developed their revenue model, so they're self-sustaining now. Um, I can go on. There's three or four other great examples. So how can we help? We can help with talent. We can help with that funding that gets them here, and we can help crowd in additional funders so that they can scale beyond that. Thank you all very much. Uh, thank you for your attentiveness, and, and uh, I've enjoyed the conversation, and uh, much appreciated. Thank you.